is Susan Wingrove Reed. I'm the education consultant for the Anchorage Symphony and the principal keyboard player. And I am so happy to be joined on Zoom with um, Elizabeth, our um, artistic advisor for the year and our conductor, conductor extraordinaire. So Elizabeth, it's great to see you again. And you're heading back to Anchorage soon for rehearsals and another concert. And we're here today to talk a little bit about the upcoming program. But before we get to that, Elizabeth, I wanted to ask you, now that we've done our opening and it was such an emotional night, if you have any reflections you'd like to share about that first concert with our orchestra after COVID. Yes, well, well you're, you're after, right. In a sense. <laughs> Indeed. Um, well, after being not, you know, not playing together as an orchestra, full orchestra for 19 months, to have accomplished artistically at the level <laughs> that the orchestra did was uh, just a wonderful, wonderful, I wouldn't say a surprise, but just, you know, it just, uh, it felt good to know that these wonderful musicians, despite the fact that they hadn't played together, came together so very quickly over the uh, cycle of rehearsals um, and performed in a very difficult situation uh, to, to perform a piece by Randy right off the bat. And um, that really set the tone, I think, to for just a, a homecoming reunion, reflection, um, and also celebration. It really was a very special evening. I'm so proud of the orchestra. I thought they sounded fantastic. Uh, of course, our concert master, uh, Catherine played beautifully in the Beethoven. Um, just every every work had special meaning. And I have to say, it's not that like we didn't throw everything and the kitchen sink at the orchestra. It was a very difficult program. Uh, you know, Dvorak Symphony Number no. 8 is one of the more virtuosic pieces for orchestra. And um, the, the uh, um, I'm, I'm blanking now. We had the Hail Stork and we had... Uh, Help me. Uh, oh, the the danson, the the danson. Yeah. I mean, both of those pieces are show pieces for orchestra, and with all the different meters and all the different moods and you know tempos and just all the things that they had to do to put it all together. I was I couldn't be more proud and impressed. Well, as a player, I have to tell you, I just found that the orchestra programming was so exciting and inspiring to be a part of, to, to be together. And I, I really appreciate that you programmed Echoes so that we could make a special tribute and acknowledgement to how we were all feeling, including you, about Randy. So yeah. thank you so much for a wonderful opening night. I would never have imagined this would have happened in September, yeah. but I too, I was just thrilled with my colleagues and was like, wow, we sound, I, I mean, I don't mean to sound demeaning, but it was like, we sound better than I thought we would. <laughs> so I came prepared and ready to work and ready to deal with all the things that came at us. So yes. and, and the audience reaction was just emotional and exhilarating and grateful so and, that's and, what the community reaction is right now so yay right. oh that yeah and that's why we do what we do is, exactly. is for the audience and so to have them live with us as well as virtual of course on stream but yeah. i mean really to have an uh the audience be with us every note every note of the way basically it yeah. was it was quite something and and very moving so we did it and we did we, it. Now we have to do well, another one. Do another <sighs> one. And yeah. things start quickly. And then the concert is November 6th. So right. I wanted to talk a little bit about this program. It's unique in a different way. And particularly with the opening work, which I have just had a field day, an emotional journey doing research on this amazing composer. And yes. I've asked and asked people around me, do you know anything about him? They've never heard of him. And it's like, <laughs> oh man, this, his life story is just unbelievable. So why don't you tell us how you found this piece and this composer? And here we go. Okay. It is not the way one would think. Um, well, I will say this. In the 1970s, there was a um, 
I think because musicologists were searching for dissertations, you know, they were searching, uh, what, what can we write about? We've, everyone's covered Brahms, everyone's covered Mozart, everyone's covered, you know, this and that, all the, gra all the greats of the canon. Um, people started digging. And I remember in college having a professor who was especially interested in women composers. And, uh, and then meeting other faculty members who were searching uh, just for composers who had been forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. Composers, diverse com uh, composers of color or uh, composers from countries that didn't have a tradition of classical music, but had written some things that, you know, had been prominent in their time. And, and uh, so that idea was percolating when I was uh, growing up and as a young musician. I was aware of Saint-Georges, uh, partly because I'm a violinist and because he wrote music for violin and because some of it was, some of it was either published or available or talked about. But it wasn't until basically the pandemic when uh, his name became uh, known to almost every orchestra. I, I have a feeling that the work we're doing is probably being programmed by a lot of orchestras around the world. But I, I really came to know him because I was in Aspen a few years back and bought a poster uh, that resembled uh, Der Rosenkavalier in that there was a, a gentleman in a cavalier uh, outfit, you know, an 18th century outfit. And um, he had a marionette and he had little 18th century figures underneath. And it, it was, I was just curious and it was kind of attractive. It reminded me of, uh, you know, an, an opera. It was a little operetta, French operetta about the um, Chevalier Dayon, who was in his time uh, a great swordsman. And researching that person and finding out more about that person, I came across a picture of uh, Deon, the Chevalier Deon, who was considered the great swordsman, having a duel with Saint-Georges, <laughs> also a great swordsman. And I believe he lost, he was older yeah. and he lost to Saint-Georges. Uh, it was a very famous um, picture because Deon was dressed as a woman. <laughs> So, I mean, uh, the, the, it's just fascinating, the whole history of that yep. time and, and the people that Saint-Georges came across, including Mozart and, and many others. Yes. Um, and so that's sort of how Saint-Georges came back into my life with that uh, old engraving of that famous duel, that sword duel. And um, of course, then remembering that he also wrote music and then going to uh, research and find a, uh, and, and look for a piece that I thought really not only expressed him at his best, mm -hmm. but also expressed a bit of his personality, a, a soldier, um, uh, a statesman, a leader, but also an incredible musician and uh, uh, someone who performed for Marie Antoinette, you know, I mean, yes. so it's like, wow. Um, and so this piece, I think, has a little bit of, of the galant in it, mm -hmm. and it's very French, and, uh, but it's also extremely, you know, accessible. Uh, it's an opera overture, although he reshaped it and called it his second symphony at some yes. point, has a little bit of difference between the two, not much mostly in ornamentation and in whether you repeat a section or not. So that's the only thing I can find the differences. But uh, the th and therefore, you're not going to get the same kind of symphonic development that you would in an overture mm -hmm. by uh, Haydn or Mozart of the time. Um, you're going to get all the themes and uh, you're going to get the mood of what's to come. So it's not really a symphony, if you know what I mean. I, to me, it's definitely an Italian overture, the fast, yeah. slow, fast form, A, B, mm -hmm. C form, fast, slow, fast. But uh, I just, I love it. It's charming and it, it you know, beautifully musical, yes. wonderful tunes and fits, uh, you know, you can tell he's a string player. 
because everything's in the hand and and yeah and Just is he knows made. The yes it's made to sound good for the mm -hmm. strings um it i don't he wasn't writing for posterity he was writing for expediency and so we have that sense about it too. It's not a monumental piece at all. It's just a, a lovely, ebullient, effervescent piece that that really brings us to the court of Marie Antoinette and to the opera of that time, mm -hmm. to the theater of that time. I think the I audience it. is gonna fall in love with this. So I thank so you too. for programming it and opening my windows into more music history that I just wanna, it's, it's kind of become, um, I'm very involved with the Alaska Black Caucus now in terms of efforts of promoting inclusion and diversity in Anchorage and in Alaska. And we just had a conference this weekend and um, I mentioned him to a number of my friends that I've met through this organization and of course nobody's heard of him. And when I started telling some of his story, it was like, what? So people are wanting me to send copies of the notes I'm writing so that they can read about him. And it's just opening a lot of wonderful doors. So wonderful. That's great. Uh, just a genius who deserves to be heard. So absolutely. He was in his time considered the greatest French musician of his time. Um, yes. A greatest composer, French composer yes. in his lifetime. So, I mean, he was highly regarded and Mozart knew him yeah. and respected yeah. him. There's no yeah. question. And I found out they lived together for two months. In they Paris did. Apartment. When uh, Mozart's mom Can, died. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine to, yeah. conversations? And yeah. Wow. So we could talk forever about him. I know. But <laughs> let's, let's segue. But thank you for those insights. And um. Next is another really cool piece by Stravinsky that was shocking and mind blowing in a new way after he'd done things like the Rite of Spring, which had everybody on their ear. And then World War I happened. And then in reemerging, here's this very different kind of score. So yes. um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Fultonella and, um, and how this well, fits the program? Yeah, I, I think. Well, partly because of the classical bent of it uh, and, and the, the looking backward uh, to older forms of music mm -hmm. and, and indeed verbatim forms of, of music. Mm -hmm. um, sort of late Baroque, uh, mm -hmm. early classical forms. Um, this is interesting. It's, it's actually Diaghilev, the, the famous aunt, uh, impresario who found some music that he want, he presented to Stravinsky and said, can you arrange this? I'd like to do a, you know, a, a, a Punch and Judy show, Pulcinella, which is yep. the, the, again, interesting, more puppets. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that idea, it, the story isn't uh, exactly Punch and Judy, but it, it has the, the idea of the, the, those marvelous made up clowns of the Commedia dell'arte. And, um, that was the ballet that he wanted to put on the stage and he wanted uh, Stravinsky to use old music and, you know, uh, Stravinskify it. <laughs> That's not a word, but it's interesting that it set Stravinsky on a new path, indeed. I think it's one of his most beautiful scores. And it's not only because he's using the music of uh, Domenico Gallo and Pergolesi and Wassenauer and uh, Monza, um, I think it's Monza or is it Monta? Monza. Um, he's using, uh, it was all attributed to Pergolesi. And that's yep. why in the program it says uh, the music of, of Pergolesi or something. But just a couple of his operas, some arias from Pergolesi, and then some marvelous uh, trios um, by and, and piano works by other composers of the time. A little bit later than Pergolesi. Pergolesi died young and was earlier. Um, at any rate, he makes the music his own. He he takes whole chunks of music by older composers, but then recolors it. Um, you know, I think of I think of Andy Warhol in some ways. You know, who would take a photo of someone and then just make it his own by coloring in the lips or, you know, blocking out lithographing a, a headpiece or whatever he would do. It's the same sort of thing with Stravinsky, although a lot more sophisticated, I would, would suggest. 
Um, however, I'm not an artist, so I shouldn't say that. I'm a visual it's artist. It's funny to uh, bring this up yeah. though, because the English uh, conductor, uh, Constant Lambert, I think his name is, yes. mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. come up with a, a comment about Pultinella that it was like Stravinsky was delighted looking at engravings of 18th century art <laughs> and then taking a big black pencil and drawing <laughs> mustaches and a big mustache yes well because he had to make he had to make what was serious uh chamber music mm -hmm. um which had a different intent now become a comedy and now become yeah. um and you you hear that especially in I think it's the fifth movement with the trombone and the bass oh you know oh, yeah. that, that is a, a beautiful um symphonia or something for cello and bass. And when you hear it in its, I think it, it I don't know if it's Vassenauer. I think, I can't remember who it is. Um, I'll have to remember, but um, could be Manza. Uh, it's a beautiful piece and it's very mellifluous and, and it just goes, mm -hmm. but then when you add a trombone playing one of the parts, yeah. the cello part and the bass part playing it, and then adding a little bit of music that doesn't quite, that isn't from yeah. the piece at all. Um, yeah. Almost sounds like a hoochie coochie dance at one point <laughs> um, with the bass player. Um, it, it just puts the humor into it. And indeed, he, he's not making fun. He's using it for a new purpose. Yes. And that, yeah. that's, I, I think it's a brilliant score. I, the opportunity to show up the orchestra is immense because everyone has this. I mean, the, the principal strings all have uh, a, a what, what would you call it a concertante role and then you have yep. the strings the rest of the strings are European or the the tutti versus solo and then of course all the winds and brass uh, trumpet and trombone um each all of them have personalities in this piece yeah. and uh lots of opportunities to show off their their great virtuosic abilities so it, it for me it was a showcase for the orchestra charming yep. piece um that was looking to older forms and therefore would fit in with what we were doing um, with Mozart and, and Saint-Georges, I thought. Oh yeah, the whole program as a unit is just a wonderful journey. So Indeed. speaking of Mozart, yes. Mozart 29, which yeah. um, I didn't have an existing note on. So I was learning all kinds of new things about his life at the time. Mm -hmm. I got Jan Swafford's new biography of Mozart and oh. found some mm -hmm. interesting stories about the time that he wrote this and what was going on, but um, this he is- He was kind of languishing in, in Salzburg at the time. He you know, was. He was not a happy person, although he had friends. So we think that he probably wrote this for an evening with, with his musician friends. Um, yeah. He, he didn't write it for a specific occasion, although he used it later on and took it yeah. with him when he, when he went yeah, to other he places. Yeah, he really was proud of the symphony. Well, he and should be. It's almost it's a perfect symphony. If there is a perfect symphony, this mm -hmm. is as close to it in terms of everything is just correct. <laughs> yeah. It's so beautifully balanced. It's so gorgeous. Um, and it's so simple. Um, yeah. It's, it scales. <laughs> the first and last movements are scales and yet they mean so much, you know, I mean, um, yes, I, I don't really know how anyone else could have done it so miraculously. Um, the second movement is a beautiful song. Um, the third movement is is impudent as a, as a yes. minuet. Yeah. I mean, it's got a lot of humor in it because it's so kind of almost a double dotted kind of feeling rather than, mm -hmm. I don't know that you could really dance to it. It's I suppose exactly you could, I'm, but mm, yeah. it goes by pretty quick. Yeah, yeah it's kind of scherzo-like in a way, isn't uh -huh. it? Then that's early. This is 1774 or something like that when this is written. So this is early on. Um, usually we think 35 and uh, Symphony 35 through 41 are the most played. Although 31, the, the Paris Symphony is also played a lot. Uh, 25, 29, 31, then 35 through 41. Those are the most popular. There are plenty of other ones that are gorgeous. But um, 29, uh, for me, it's... it it epitomizes what you think of when you think of Mozart in terms of its, its clarity of form, but it transcends all of that. It transcends all of its parts and becomes just a beautiful statement of, uh, you know, just yeah. it allows the orchestra to shine and be beautiful. It, 
Yeah. It's super demanding for orchestra though. Well, yeah. We're going to work hard on it because precision is key to getting that elegance and that balance and that light. Right. Yeah. There's simplicity here, but yet it's very, very complex in other ways and mm -hmm. performance mode. Definitely. Yeah. And to think that he was 18 years old when he yeah. wrote it. I mean, just blew mine. symphony 29 yeah. at 18. Yeah. Wow. I know. <laughs> Well, I think he wrote his first one at seven, so he was he was yeah, already yeah. a pro by eighteen. They've been writing yeah. for a decade, you know. <laughs> but yes, but it's, it's, I agree. It's just such a wonderful way to end the concert. It's getting so much darker here now as we head into December, yes. December, and this, there, there's so much joy in the program. November sixth, uh, absolutely. Looking so. forward looking forward to it and elizabeth thank you so much and we are so appreciative of your um leadership and musicianship with us this season to help us with our transition and um and are just enjoying working with you so much so thank Great. you feelings mutual thank you so much yes see you at the concert thanks bye-bye susan